All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Really exciting to see uh, groups starting to join us in the live event. So normally we'd be broadcasting these live to classrooms across North America and beyond. But through the power of technology, we can keep doing this. Uh, but this time broadcasting into the homes of students uh, and educators uh, and parents. So really awesome to be able to continue uh, these live events. All right, we are heading to Norway and to uh, Svalbard in the Arctic Circle. So uh, Sunova Sorbi and Hilda Strom, they have been now living in Svalbard for over 200 days, living in the remote trapper's cabin, Bumsabu. In total, they will spend uh, nine months there and maybe even longer now, and in the process, becoming the first women uh, to ever overwinter uh, on their own. So along the way, they've been taking part in different citizen science projects, ranging from projects for scripts, uh, uh, like ocean projects, taking ice core samples, uh, looking at phytoplankton, also projects for NASA, uh, looking at the auroras. So they have kept busy, that's for sure. Uh, each month, we've been able to connect with them for live calls with different experts from around the world. So whether it was ocean plastics, climate change, technology, it's been a blast so far, and today our theme is our ocean. So we have marine biologist uh, Pia Dillon joining us today. Uh, she wants us all to do one thing, and that's jump into the sea, because the most important thing we can do for our ocean is to love it. So Pia holds a master's uh, degree in marine biology, and for the past 10 years has held a number of lectures and workshops on the sea. She talks about our marvelous ocean, cold water corals, uh, photosynthesizing snails, plastics, you name it, anything about our big blue planet and how we need to protect our ocean as an important resource. So Hilda and Sunova, it's so great to have you joining us live today. Now we're connecting via satellite, so we can't see you, but we have the satellite uh, connection, but you always send us a nice little video. So we, we get a little hello. So here we go. My screen is shared. I'm going to play that video. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. We are at Spa Bodies now, 78 degrees north. And we are living in really, really strange times right now with the coronavirus, where we're all needing to self-isolate. We're thinking of you. And we've been here now for seven months in our own self-imposed isolation. And we want you to join us via the live YouTube links with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We all need to be connected now. And it's a lot to learn, and it's a lot of fun. And this is Hi from Spotify. See you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, stopping that screen share. Hilda and Sunova, so good to have you joining us. Um, why don't you take over for a little bit and tell us a little bit about what you've been up to lately. Okay, and um, thanks so much, Joe. And Pia, thank you so much for being on the call today. Uh, today is technically the last call that we're hosting with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, so thank you, Joe. But we are going to continue because we're going to be at Bumsaboo for a lot longer than we expected. We were going to get picked up in May. We have been really busy this winter, as Joe said, um, collecting uh, aurora images for NASA. We have been recently um, out on the sea ice. There's a tremendous amount of sea ice around us. Um, and the only way anybody can get to us is currently with a snowmobile. So we have collected. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, satellite signal uh, can be a little bit tricky from uh, somewhere so far away. So it looks like we may have lost Hilda and Cinema. They're usually able to call back pretty quickly. So. I'm gonna give them maybe 30 seconds or so to see if they're able to call back. Sometimes they'll call via their satellite phone directly to my phone. So we'll see what solution they go for this time, whether they try to restart their Iridium link or if they try to just call directly uh, via the satellite phone. So um, we'll give it just a second here. Uh, for those who are starting to tune in live via the YouTube, don't forget there's a chat on the right. You can send, let us know where you're watching from, send in some questions, and of course, we'll work them in. And I don't see them yet. So Pia, I think we are gonna shift gears. Uh, I already introduced you and the awesome work that you're doing uh, in Norway around marine biology and sharing the word about our ocean and why it needs to be protected. So maybe we'll let you take over for a little bit. 
share your presentation, and then we can talk to Hilda and Sunova uh, when they're able to rejoin us. All right. Yep. Yeah, sure we can do that. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in and uh, talking about the ocean. My name is, as uh, just said, Pia. I'm a marine biologist. And I am going to share my screen and take you on journey down into the deep sea, or at least the, the, the top of the deep sea. So um, I work as a freelance marine biologist, and that means that I get a lot of um, uncertainties, especially in these times around my job. So, but it's also one of the funnest things I've ever done in my entire life. I can choose whatever I want to do. And one of the things I have chosen to do is work with conservation, ocean conservation, mainly through an organization called Passion for Ocean that I've been started with a friend of mine. We have one goal, except from you know the obvious, and that is to get everybody to just get their eyes open to how amazing the ocean is and why you should want to take care of it. So now these days you have a lot of these people, you know, on one side saying, hey, we have all these problems. And then on the other side, you have people going, yeah, but we have all these solutions. And both of them are so important to talk about. But in the midst, in between there, we tend to forget about the why. So why do we do what we do? So why, do, why should you change your life to preserve a coral or a little nude rank or something that you've never even heard of? Now, there's probably as many reasons to want to take care of the ocean as there are people on earth, but I'm going to you know, drag you through a couple of the reasons why I think we should um, care. And one of them is this guy. Now, this is a sea spider or pycnogonid. They are one of my favorite little animals because they're so elusive. They are not uncommon, but they're uncommon to see. I see them on maybe one in 50 dives. Um, and, you know, they do not exactly give me a lot of food on my platter. They're super skinny and tiny. Uh, they obviously are not an important economic species, otherwise everybody would have known about it, I guess. And to be frankly, we don't really know if the ecosystem would care if we remove them. So we're one of two of the species. But, you know, should that matter when we talk about conservation? I don't think so. I mean, usually when people talk about the ocean or nature and conservation, we always put a price tag on it. So the ocean is worth this and that. Oh, we have to preserve this fish stock because it gives me us this much money. But we, I sincerely believe that, you know, the value of life itself is also a big, big, big reason to actually do conservation work. And I mean, the fact that evolution has now spent hundreds of millions of years into evolving this thing that's so skinny that it has to squeeze its intestines out into its legs. I mean, that's just so awesome that, I don't know, <laughs> I think that's worth taking care of. Another one is one of my favorites. I, this is the velvet belly lantern shark. And this is one of the eight or nine species of sharks that we have up here in Norway. Uh, no, none of those sharks eat people. And no, these green little dots are not Photoshop. This is actually a bioluminescent shark. And I know for a fact that they also are, you know, some of these cousins of these are located around the globe. So if you're watching from somewhere that they have these lantern sharks, go have fun. I mean, watching these guys when they swim in their habitat in pitch black is amazing. They glow up like these tiny little lanterns and swim around being just the most amazing little creatures. So yes, we have bioluminescent sharks in Norway. That's so ridiculous. Now, if we take one step back from, you know, all lives matter and into something that involves every single person um, out there, uh, you included, we have to talk about oxygen. So most people know that trees and grass, they produce oxygen through photosynthesis. And that's also the same thing with kelp and seaweed and algae in general. But most people don't really realize how much of this oxygen comes from the ocean. Now for every fourth breath you take, about three of them are sponsored by the ocean, which is kind of crazy. Um, so the ocean is actually responsible for us being alive. And it is also responsible for making, you know, burnout people like me really happy. So this is me doing what I love to do most, namely be super quiet, just sit still watching stuff moving super slowly. 
Uh, I have tried meditating so many times and I just cannot for the love of me do it. But just going into the ocean, you have this completely different setting. I mean, gravity doesn't work anymore, sort of. It's all, it's not quiet, but it's noisy in a completely different way. Um, you have all these colors and shapes and weird functions just surrounding you everywhere. Um, and there's just so much, you know, Zen going into there. And the kelp forest also protects our shores. Now the kelp forest around the globe protects that covers about one fourth of all the world's coastlines and they are a massive wave breaker. So if you see big, you know, surge coming in after it passes through this kelp forest, it will be sort of tiny little kryptonite ripples when it comes by. So it actually protects our coastlines um, to really for erosion. And in this kelp, you also have thousands of species growing up. You have tiny little cod, you have sea urchins and polychaetes and sea stars and everything. So this is a nursery and a feeding place for a bunch of animals. Now, I also want to talk to you about eelgrass because eelgrass might not look too fancy pants, but in one square meter of this, scientists have found 290,000 little animals. And there's a lot of numbers going back and forth, but somebody say 30% more, somebody say 35 times as much, but everybody has sort of a consensus that the eelgrass beds and the kelp forests of the ocean just captures a gazillion times more carbon than the forest on land. Not saying that the forest on land are not important. I'm just saying that the, these habitats are extremely crucial for us in keeping, you know, not, not gonna say the balance of things, but yeah. And one of the cool things that you can find in the kelp forest and in the eelgrass are these nudibranchs. So a uh, running joke in the biology world is that if somebody sends you a text, you know, send nudes, you send them a nudibranch and then, you know, we'll laugh and we do this awkward little biology thing. But nudibranchs are amazing. They are naked snails. They sort of forgot to get dressed that day. And they, so they have to figure out another way to protect themselves. So one of the, the strategies uh, you can see from this one is that it eats hydroids, which is a, um, they have nematocysts, same thing as, you know, lion's mane jellyfish and stuff like that, so that burns. They eat these hydroids and they just capture the nematocysts, take care of them and just place them in their little flaps and they use that for protection. It's called kleptoplastia and it's really cool. Uh, you also have some nudibranchs that look like this and these guys, they do kleptoplastia with Algae, so they eat the algae and they preserve the chlorophyll or no, the chloroplasts, which is the part of the algae that does photosynthesis, puts it into these little fringes on their back. And whenever the sun comes out, they just unfold their wings and photosynthesize. So they create their own oxygen and sugar. And that is pretty cool, if you ask me. <laughs> and now if we dive deep into the forest, no, not the forest, the ocean. I mean, this is, I mean, I could talk to you guys for decades about how much stuff is down there, but I'm just gonna show you a third and most important thing that we have up here in Norway, and that's a coral reef. So most of you have probably heard about corals, and we do have them up north as well. There is massive amounts of um, deep water corals up here. We actually have the world's biggest amount of deep water corals, and also the biggest reef in the world uh, with these guys. So down in these reefs, you have all this, you know, you have krill, um, you have shrimp, big, big, big mussels, there's polychaetes, there's um, sponges, and all kinds of things that you probably never, you know, heard about. And these are also just as important as the kelp forest. And they do act as a nursery and feeding grounds for thousands of species as well. Now I'm gonna just, briefly go by this one before I, you know, shut, <laughs> shut up, uh, because this is one of my favorite little animals to talk about to why we have to, you know, spend more energy exploring the oceans instead of just destroying them, and that's the crystal jelly. Now, this one is one that we find here in Norway. You guys on the other side of the Atlantic has uh, its cousin. It's called the Acarea victoria, and it's bioluminescent. And in that little jellyfish, researchers have extracted a little protein called the green fluorescent protein. And that protein has now won a Nobel Prize, solved eight medical mysteries, and it's just been 
a great leap forward in the medical uh, industry. And I figured if one little protein from one little jellyfish like this can do all of that, just imagine what kind of treasures are out there because we have explored, I would say maybe 5% of the ocean. So there's so much more to learn. Um, and now I obviously have probably 10,000 more species to talk about. I'm not gonna do that because we're gonna run out of time. I just wanna, you know, have a little shout out to everybody going out there picking plastics and doing their thing, but also a little reminder to everybody to remember to have fun doing all of it. And I honestly believe that if you just go out into the ocean and hug a piece of seaweed or pet a little snail on its back, and just get to know them. Talk to your local barnacle or something like that. Just learn to know your oceans. And then I would probably say that the the will to change your life, to take care of it, is just going to come by itself. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Very cool, Pia. Thanks so much for sharing uh, that with us today. I mean, I've been diving oh, since 2007. I love uh, the ocean. So it's always great to be able to show images and share stories uh, about the marine life with people who may not have experienced uh, the ocean in the way other people have. And so that brings me to a first question. Um, while we wait for Hilda and Cinema to call back, I had a little chat with them uh, while you were presenting. So they're going to call back in a couple minutes and we'll get some questions for them. But uh, oh, actually, let's just put a pause in that because here they are. So they're calling us via satellite phone now from Bumsabu in Svalbard. Hey, Hilda and Sinova, how are you? Hey there, we're doing good, thanks. Nice to be back. Okay, well, let me, uh, Pia, just great timing. She just finished another awesome presentation. Uh, do you want to take over for a little bit and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to? Yeah, um, we have been busy collecting ice core samples. There's, uh, we're surrounded by ice here. And, um, we collected a sample that was about 36 centimeters long. And what's super interesting about that is you think there's just ice, um, but they're actually looking for the little organisms that live inside the sea ice. Um, and since we're losing sea ice habitat, um, the university center in, in Norway is really interested to study the little tiny organisms that live in these small brine channels underneath the ice that feed on the ice algae. So we're learning a lot about um, stuff that Pia is an expert on. Um, you'd think there was nothing right underneath the ice between that and the water, but there's a ton of stuff. And what's really interesting for us is because of all the stuff going on with COVID right now, um, it looks like we're the only ones that are able to contribute samples to, um, to a couple of different researchers up here on things that we're doing. We've been here almost uh, seven months now. Actually, it's been seven months, and we're going to extend our stay um, for a while longer. So we're going to continue to take cloud observations, wildlife observations. We just actually had a little Arctic fox come up to the window this morning. Um, that was quite a sight. And um, we're also going to continue with the ice core samples and snow samples. So it's been... Um, keeping us really busy here, but it feels like extremely valuable work given all the changes that we're seeing with our climate and uh, biodiversity. All right. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of your other visitors who might be a little bit bigger than the Arctic fox that peeks in your window? <laughs> yes, um, we have had some big visitors here. And as some of you might know on the call, our neighbors are... Um, 140 kilometers away, like the town of Lungesian is that far away. So our nearest neighbor is a polar bear. And um, a, a week ago, we had a um, mother polar bear and the two pups, and they're pretty, they're quite big actually, um, that were just out on the ice. We had gone for a run down on the ice. We always take, um, you know, some safety um, equipment with us for the polar bears. And we were running on the ice, and we came back and looked through the binoculars, and it, we could see them coming towards Bumsabu, towards our hut. So we were about 500 meters away from them without knowing it. They're a beautiful, beautiful um, marine mammal, and we, you know, we only want to live in harmony with it. But we've had how many um, visits total, Linda, would you say? 
Yeah, we figure over 30 visits of polar bears uh, to date. So it's been, um, they surprise us sometimes. I walked out the door on one occasion at night in the dark polar night, and I came back in, turned, we have a um, security light outside, turned the light on, and it scared the polar bear. It came out from the right side of Bumsabu, right in front of me, just two meters away. So that's about six feet in front of me. And that was my first uh, polar bear encounter up here in, um, during this time. So it was quite a scare. Um, but they are amazing. And we actually saw one hunt a reindeer, which is very, very unusual. They hunt seals. And the seals hang out on the ice. And so they're learning the polar bears, we think, and so do the researchers, are learning to adapt to a changing environment up here. So it's very, very super interesting for us to actually document all of this different behavior and what we're seeing from change, from one season to another. All right, very cool. And before we shift gears a little bit, I want to remind anyone tuning in today to use the chat sidebar on the right and send us in uh, some questions. But I'd like to ask one more thing about where you're living. So, so we talked about Bumsabu as a trapper's cabin, and some people might picture, you know, a nice cabin, big bookshelf, roaring fire. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like uh, living uh, in really the ultimate self isolation uh, for the last, say, 200 plus days? Absolutely. So Bumsabu, um, Bumsa is bear and boo is like hut. So it means little bear hut. And it is, um, this cabin we're living in was built in 1930. There is absolutely no insulation um, and there's no electricity or running water. So what we have is a wood burning stove um, and there's no wood around here. The wood that we have around here has drifted in from Siberia. So we go and collect it from the, with the snowmobile, bring it back here, chop it up, and put that in the um, wood burning fireplace. And for running water, this out and collect ice, and we bring this side here at Mountain. It's a real fair uh, cabin. It has, um, if you see pictures of it on our website, um, you'll see these round logs that come out at an angle from outside of the house. And those logs are actually designed on purpose um, to prevent the polar bear from squeezing in between them to get into the hut itself. So um, it's a it's a fascinating little hut, um, but it's very bare bones. Uh, and so far, knock on all the wood that's here, it's keeping us extremely safe in some nasty hurricane winds um, and real cold temperatures today. But um, they built it uh, for beluga hunting. Um, and it uh, was used primarily for that, and now it's a, it's a cultural a heritage site in a national park in, in um, Spitsbergen. So we're very uh, fortunate to be here. And we have, we have solar and wind that we're using for our power needs. All right, pretty awesome. So let's get uh, a few questions going. Let's go to Pia and hit her with a marine biology question. So Pia, we had an event earlier this morning, uh, probably before most people are up. We were reaching an audience in Norway, speaking in Norwegian, at least you and Hilda were uh, this morning, definitely not me. But, um, you know, we, we talked about kelp forests and we all always think about kelp forests off the west coast of California and how they kind of deal with issues of sea urchins kind of overpopulating and releasing the kelp from their anchorage when they feed on the base. Is something similar like that happening with the kelp off the coast of Norway? Yes, and thank you for that. I mean, yes, it has been massive. Do we get them? Are we getting them back? Uh, I think maybe someone accidentally hit the redial button. I think we're good. <laughs> so yeah, no, uh, there are actually, it's been a big problem uh, along the Norwegian coast as well. And we talked about this earlier that Norway actually has the world's second longest coastline right after you in Canada. Um, and we as such have a lot of seaweed and a lot of kelp, but we also have a lot of sea urchins and we've been hunting down the predators of sea urchins uh, for decades, um, leaving the sea urchins to just kind of go berserk, just as they've done in California and in Tasmania and all these other places where you can see a massive decline in kelp forests. And especially in, the, there has been some fjords that have been just left completely barren. I've been diving in some of them and it's like this, echinoderm um, 
desert. There's only sea urchins, starfish, and um, cucumbers, sea cucumbers, for some reason, and and snails, some snails as well. But the kelp is gone, the fish is gone, and it's just nothing there left, uh, which is kind of sad. But and we are yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pose this question uh, to both groups. First to Pia, and then I'd like to hear Hilda and Sinova uh, what they're observing. So Pia, when you get into the water uh, off the coast, how um, much plastic do you see in the water? How how big of a part of your free dives or dives are, are is it? Ooh, <laughs> massive, I would say. It's kind of depressing actually I hate talking about it to be honest but I've been working on marine plastics since 2011 uh, I've been diving with the certificate since 2004 or I, I mean I've been in the water since I was born in 2000 not 1986 that is um and there's always been plastic I'm one of the unlucky people who just grew up with plastic surrounding me and there, it's everywhere so we've had a lot of underwater cleanups uh, especially in the Oslo fjord but also all along uh, Norway there are so many amazing dive groups now that pick up plastics and I mean we have had pick up like cleanup events where we've picked up six seven tons of plastic in a couple of hours because you can, it just never runs out. And especially in the inner part of the Oslo Fjord, there's not just, you know, golf balls and hairbrushes and sort of tampons and condoms and all the things that you would normally find, but also cars, whole cars. We, there's a lot of um, tires, obviously, from the decks and the docks, but you, we've found multiple intact cars. Uh, we found semi trucks. Uh, the whole bottom is just carpet bombed with old boats, fishing like just normal boats that people just want, you know, they don't want to use them anymore. But instead of pulling them on shore and just disposing of them properly, they would just drill a hole and sink them because that's easier and cheaper. So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty much everywhere. I have not been go diving anywhere, including seawater, not uh, freshwater ponds where I haven't found plastic. All right. So Hilda and Sinova, uh, obviously are much further north. What are you seeing plastic wise uh, since you've been up there? Yeah, great question. When we got here in September, we did see quite a bit of plastic. Of course, there was no snow cover then. So there was uh, quite a bit of debris. We have a circum circumpolar current up here. And so just like the driftwood coming in um, with that current, so does a lot of plastic. There's way too much snow around us right now um, for us to see any plastic, but as we get some melt, we'll see more um, because there have been, we've seen some big jumps and some fishing, um, very thick uh, fishing rope um, up on the, uh, the shoreline, the coastline here as well. So uh, we have picked up quite a bit in, um, in August when we were here and then also in September, and we'll continue to do that. But right now we have way too much snow to observe anything and um, we have been in the water. He has talked me into going for a quick uh, couple of dips in the water, but um, it's too fast for us to even observe anything. I get in and out as quick as I get in. So, um, but we're gonna continue to observe that when, um, you know, when the summer is here, which is June, July, August. All right, so we talked about a couple, you know, issues that are facing the ocean. We talked about the kelp, uh, biodiversity loss. We talked about the plastics. Let's switch gears and go a little happier now. So Pia, can you tell us about an experience you had in the water that just, you know, keeps you coming back? Can you tell us about an amazing experience you had in the ocean? Oh, huh. <laughs> that's a difficult one. I have had so many ridiculous experiences. Um, but one of the things that I remember the best was probably when I was in, I lived in Hawaii for six months. And I was out snorkeling when a friend, when I just heard, boop, 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 and I figured she'd just seen another fish with colors. Uh, I turned around and I saw two spotted eagle rays about two or three meters from us. And that was just such a cool experience. And I swam around with them for about, I would say half an hour before I left them alone. Um, I've also met octopus while diving, which is, I, that's an experience that you just cannot compare to anything. The octopus is probably the smartest creature on earth, including us. 
it can change every single cell in its skin, just both color-wise, but also in terms of shape. So they can blend into absolutely anything, but they are completely colorblind, so we don't really understand how they work. Um, and they have um, de most definitely developed personalities. So they have conscience, they have, <laughs> so they have personalities, they can change all these colors and they can just turn into whatever they want to be, just like that. And it's so fascinating to watch. So for, to be honest, I, I think they just, I think they're a practical joke that some aliens passed by here a couple thousand years ago and saying, haha, there's this planet full of monkeys with anxiety. Let's just place this weird little creature down there to confuse them. Um, but I also had a lot of really great experiences up here in the cold. Um, it might sound weird to love going diving when it's almost below zero in the water as well. But the water is crystal clear and I got to dive with orcas up in Tromsø a couple years ago and that was majestic, terrifying and majestic at the same time. Um, but they are gentle giants. They know exactly what they're doing and they know that you're not food. So as long as you don't bug them, you know, that's just really something that I would um, tell everybody to do. All right, very cool. So Hilda and Sinova, you uh, have seen some pretty beautiful things yourself in your time. Uh, you've just come out of a fairly extended period of 24 hour darkness, the polar winter, but you had pretty amazing light shows uh, most nights. Can you tell us a little bit about the auroras and what you were doing for NASA? Yeah, um, and wow, I just have to say what an absolute um, gift it is to be up here for the length of time we were to observe the aurora. We were outside photographing as much time lapse as we could in minus 32 degree temperatures. Um, and we forget that we're in the dark and we forget that there could be polar bears around. It was so worth it. The lights have been absolutely astounding up here. NASA has a program called Aurora Sortis. It's a citizen science program. And it's actually Citizen Science Month um, in April. So that's pretty cool. What we're doing for them is we're capturing the photos, and it's possible we sent a bunch of images to our key contact there, Liz, and, and it's possible that we've spotted some aurora that they've never seen before. Um, we've taken lots of photos. We had some uh, nights where the, the aurora was just completely showering us from above. Uh, we don't need to travel north to go and see them from where we are because we're so far north already. Um, but they're just like the aurora, just like they're studying weather. They think, um, NASA thinks that there's some very interesting things happening with the light, with the, um, the magnetism and, uh, the aurora itself that they can help understand, um, uh, solar storms and the interruption that we have with technology and the such. So uh, all the information we're collecting from them, when we see the aurora, how intense it is, what colors, how high, all of that is um, super interesting. And anybody can be part of um, Aurora Saurus if they're in a place where they can see the light. So I have to say that, um, you know, despite the long putter night, which was well over three months, and my first experience in so, so much darkness, uh, it was an amazing thing to be here for such a long period of time to see all the lights that we um, that we experienced. Absolutely incredible. All right. Well, Pia, let's slip back uh, beneath the surface. And you mentioned that you spent time in Hawaii and obviously you dive in the colder northern waters around Norway. How would you compare the biodiversity between the two spots, between the warm waters and the cold waters? Oh, that is, uh, okay. I may get shunned by this, but Hawaii is a really isolated island group. So the biodiversity there is not as massive as it would be closer to say, you know, we're closer to shore. Um, but the biodiversity there was, it was big, but it's, I would say bigger in a way. <laughs> Everything is bigger up north because it's so cold. No, but, um, I, there's two completely different worlds. The corals you see in Hawaii are shallow water corals. They have this um, symbiosis with the, the zooxanthellae little algae that makes them this colorful. Um, this little algae makes up about 90% of the corals 
uh, energy. Um, the corals in Norway are bigger. They are deeper and they are more, I would say, brutal sort of looking. They are just more massive. Um, but you also have to go down to at least 40 meters to see them. So it's not as easy to snorkel on coral reefs up here as it is in Hawaii. Um, the temperature was definitely a big thing. I mean, it's way easier to just put on a snorkel and, uh, you know, a mask and jump in the water in 26 degrees instead of two that we have up here sometimes. Um, but still, the amount of weird creatures are the same in both places. And I would say, especially the night dives in Hawaii were the coolest ones because then all the, the little crustaceans, the crabs, the shrimps and the lobsters and all these guys came out to say hi. I mean, didn't really see them during the day, but no, two completely different worlds and I love them both. All right, very cool. So, uh, Sinva, uh, we're going to pose this question as I think it's a really good kind of wrap up question to you first at Bumsabu, and then we'll go back to Pia. What kind of advice would you give for any future conservationists, explorers, scientists who might be tuning in today? Well, given everything that's happening today, that is an excellent question. And, you know, uh, the whole, the entire reason that um, Hilda and myself decided to start Hearts in the Ice um, and do what we're doing, collecting data for scientists studying climate change, it is because we want to create stories around what we're experiencing, what we're collecting, and what we're observing so that we all understand what in the world these changes actually mean to biodiversity, to weather, to people, uh, displaced people around the world, our food, all of that. It's a web that's so interconnected. So I would, you know, we would both say uh, for everyone on the call, regardless of your age or where you live, is stay curious, um, get involved with projects locally or understand your backyard. Um, you know, be active, um, stand up for, for what you believe in, understand the changes in your environment. Um, if you're, if you're so inclined, get active politically because we can see that we need leaders out there that really believe in the fact that everything is connected and that it's not just about one person winning. It's about the collective. So we, we really want to encourage everybody to, Fall in love with your backyard. Um, you know, Mother Nature needs her daughters, and him and I have answered the call, and there's a lot more people on the phone call right now, men and women, boys and girls, that are really needed to um, to do their part. So I would just, yeah, again, just um, be, stay passionately curious and, and get engaged and understand that each person has an absolutely um, phenomenal, powerful, valuable contribution to make. All right. And that's, that's, that's our purpose. That's, yeah. Awesome. And Pia, what would you add to that on your end? Oh, I mean, I could not agree more. I think uh, the fact like getting to know nature and, you know, get learned, go out there and be curious and explore and learn what everything is all about. Uh, respect the animals, respect everybody else that is out there, not just other people, but the rest of the animal kingdom that we are just a part of just as much as any earthworm or a cockroach. Uh, and I mean, one of the best things I've ever heard, I think, is that today people tend to get hit in the face with this whole, I'm just one person, what can I do? But I mean, the biggest no-go in Back to the Future movies is just don't tamper with anything because just a tiny little thing could change the entire future before you. So, I mean, if that is the truth for science fiction movies or whatever, yeah, this would definitely be the same thing here. So whatever you do today will definitely change the outcome of the future. So don't feel hopeless or helpless in this massive um, thing that we, you know, stand for now. But anything you do, any little contribution helps. All right, absolutely. So first of all, I wanna say a huge thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Thanks for the great questions. A uh, huge thank you, Pia, for uh, joining us for a double header today. Two languages. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, you're doing great work and look forward to showcasing some more of it. And Hilda and Sunva, thank you so much um, for what you're doing. It's a massive commitment. 
uh, organizing all these events, uh, you know, despite the elements and technology and, and uh, really appreciate it, everything that you do. Well, right back at you, Joe. You have been absolutely amazing rolling with our disconnections uh, on and off. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Pia. All right. Well, one more huge shout out to everybody. Thank you so much for joining in today. Enjoy the rest of your days and we will see you uh, in future events. Thanks so much, everyone.